Chapter 17, The Flight. Mr. Flint was hard pushed for house servants, and rather than lose me, he had restrained his malice. I did my work faithfully, though not, of course, with a willing mind. They were evidently afraid I should leave them. Mr. Flint wished that I should sleep in the great house instead of the servants' quarters. His wife agreed to the proposition, but said I mustn't bring my bed into the house because it would scatter feathers on her carpet. I knew when I went there that they would never think of such a thing as furnishing a bed of any kind for me and my little one. I therefore carried my own bed, and now I was forbidden to use it. I did as I was ordered, but now that I was certain my children were to be put in their power in order to give them a stronger hold on me, I resolved to leave them that night. I remembered the grief this step would bring upon my dear old grandmother, and nothing less than the freedom of my children would have induced me to disregard her advice. I went about my evening work with trembling steps. Mr. Flint twice called from his chamber door to inquire why the house was not locked up. I replied that I had not done my work. You've had time enough to do it, said he. Take care how you answer me. I shut all the windows, locked all the doors, and went up to the third story to wait till midnight. How long those hours seemed, and how fervently I prayed that God would not forsake me in this hour of utmost need. I was about to risk everything on the throw of a die, and if I failed, oh, what would become of me and my poor children? They would be made to suffer for my fault. At half past twelve I stole softly downstairs. I stopped on the second floor, thinking I heard a noise. I felt my way down into the parlor and looked out of the window. The night was so intensely dark that I could see nothing. I raised the window very softly and jumped out. Large drops of rain were falling and the darkness bewildered me. I dropped on my knees and breathed a short prayer to God for guidance and protection. I groped my way to the road and rushed towards the town with almost lightning speed. I arrived at my grandmother's house but dared not see her. She would say, Linda, you are killing me, and I knew that that would unnerve me. I tapped softly at the window of a room, occupied by a woman who had lived in the house for several years. I knew she was a faithful friend and could be trusted with my secret. I tapped several times before she heard me. At last she raised the window and I whispered, Sally, I have run away. Let me in, quick. She opened the door softly and said in low tones, For God's sake, don't. Your grandmother is trying to buy you and to children. Mr. Sands was here last week. He told her he was going away on business, but he wanted her to go ahead about buying you and to children, and he would help her all he could. Don't run away, Linda. Your grandmother is all bowed down with trouble now. I replied, Sally, they are going to carry my children to the plantation tomorrow, and they will never sell them to anybody so long as they have me in their power. Now, would you advise me to go back? No, child, no, answered she. When they find you is gone, they won't want to plague of the children. Where is you going to hide? They knows every inch of this house. I told her I had a hiding place, and that was all it was best for her to know. I asked her to go into my room as soon as it was light and take all my clothes out of my trunk and pack them in hers, for I knew Mr. Flint and the constable would be there early to search my room. I feared the sight of my children would be too much for my full heart, but I could not go out into the uncertain f future without one last look. I bent over the bed where lay my little Benny and baby Ellen. Poor little ones, fatherless and motherless. Memories of their father came over me. He wanted to be kind to them, but they were not all to him, as they were to my womanly heart. I knelt and prayed for the innocent little sleepers. I kissed them lightly and turned away. As I was about to open the street door, Sally laid her hand on my shoulder and said, Linda, is you gone all alone? Let me call your uncle. No, Sally, I replied. I want no one to be brought into trouble on my account. 
I went forth into the darkness and rain. I ran on till I came to the house of the friend who was to conceal me. Early the next morning, Mr. Flint was at my grandmother's inquiring for me. She told him she had not seen me and supposed I was at the plantation. He watched her face narrowly and said, Don't you know anything about her running off? She assured him that she did not. He went on to say, Last night she ran off without the least provocation. We had treated her very kindly. My wife liked her. She will soon be found and be brought back. Are her children with you? When told that they were, he said, I am very glad to hear that. If they are here, she cannot be far off. If I find out that any of my niggers have had anything to do with this damn business, I'll give them 500 lashes. As he started to go to his father's, he turned round and added persuasively, Let her be brought back and she shall have her children to live with her. The tidings made the old doctor rave and storm at a furious rate. It was a busy day for them. My grandmother's house was searched from top to bottom. As my trunk was empty, they concluded I had taken my clothes with me. Before ten o'clock, every vessel northward bound was thoroughly examined, and the law against harboring fugitives was read to all on board. At night, a watch was set over the town. Knowing how distressed my grandmother would be, I wanted to send her a message, but it could not be done. Everyone who went in or out of her house was closely watched. The doctor said he would take my children unless she became responsible for them, which, of course, she willingly did. The next day was spent in searching. Before night, the following advertisement was posted at every corner and in every public place for miles round. $300 reward ran away from the subscriber, an intelligent, bright mulatto girl named Linda, 21 years of age, 5 feet 4 inches high, dark eyes, and black hair inclined to curl, but it can be made straight, has a decayed spot on a front tooth. She can read and write, and in all probability will try to get to the free states. All persons are forbidden under penalty of law to harbor or employ said slave. $150 will be given to whoever takes her in the state and $300 have taken out of the state and delivered to me or lodged in jail. Dr. Flint. Chapter 18. Months of Peril. The search for me was kept up with more perseverance than I had anticipated. I began to think that escape was impossible. I was in great anxiety lest I should implicate the friend who harbored me. I knew the consequences would be frightful, and much as I dreaded being caught, even that seemed better than causing an innocent person to suffer for kindness to me. A week had passed in terrible suspense, when my pursuers came into such close vicinity that I concluded they had tracked me to my hiding place. I flew out of the house and concealed myself in a thicket of bushes. There I remained in agony of fear for two hours. Suddenly, a reptile of some kind seized my leg. In my fright, I struck a blow which loosened its hold, but I could not tell whether I had killed it. It was so dark, I could not see what it was. I only knew it was something cold and slimy. The pain I felt soon indicated that the bite was poisonous. I was compelled to leave my place of concealment, and I groped my way back into the house. The pain had become intense, and my friend was startled. By my look of anguish. I asked her to prepare a poultice of warm ashes and vinegar, and I applied it to my leg, which is already much swollen. The application gave me some relief, but the swelling did not abate. The dread of being disabled was greater than the physical pain I endured. My friend asked an old woman, who doctored among the slaves, what was good for the bite of a snake or a lizard. <clears throat> She told her to steep a dozen coppers in vinegar overnight and apply the cankered vinegar to the inflamed part. I had succeeded in cautiously conveying some messages to my relatives. They were harshly threatened and despairing of my having a chance to escape. They advised me to return to my master, ask his forgiveness, and let him make an example of me. But such counsel had no influence with me. When I started up upon this hazardous undertaking, I had resolved that, come what would, there should be no turning back. 
Give me liberty or give me death was my motto. When my friend contrived to make known to my relatives the painful situation I had been in for 24 hours, they said no more about my going back to my master. Something must be done, and that speedily. But where to return for help? They knew not. God, in his mercy, raised up a friend in need. Among the ladies who were acquainted with my grandmother was one who had known her from childhood and always been very friendly to her. She had also known my mother and her children and felt interested for them. At this crisis of affairs, she called to see my grandmother, as she not unfrequently did. She observed the sad and troubled expression of her face and asked if she knew where Linda was and whether she was safe. My grandmother shook her head without answering. Come, Aunt Martha, said the kind lady. Tell me all about it. Perhaps I can do something to help you. The husband of this lady held many slaves and bought and sold slaves. She also held a number in her own name, but she treated them kindly and would never allow any of them to be sold. She was unlike the majority of slaveholders' wives. My grandmother looked earnestly at her. Something in the expression of her face said, Trust me! And she did trust her. She listened attentively to the details of my story and sat thinking for a while. At last she said, Aunt Martha, I pity you both. If you think there is any chance of Linda's getting to the free states, I will conceal her for a time. But first you must solemnly promise that my name shall never be mentioned. If such a thing should become known, it would ruin me and my family. No one in my house must know of it except the cook. She is so faithful that I would trust my own life with her, and I know she likes Linda. It is a great risk, but I trust no harm will come of it. Get word to Linda to be ready as soon as it is dark, before the patrols are out. I will send the housemaids on errands, and Betty shall go to meet Linda. The place where we were to meet was designated and agreed upon. My grandmother was unable to thank the lady for this noble deed, overcome by her emotions. She sank on her knees and sobbed like a child. I received a message to leave my friend's house at such an hour and go to a certain place where a friend would be waiting for me. As a matter of prudence, no names were mentioned. I had no means of conjecturing who I was to meet or where I was going. I did not like to move thus blindfolded, but I had no choice. It would not do for me to remain where I was. I disguised myself, summoned up courage to meet the worst, and went to the appointed place. My friend Betty was there. She was the last person I expected to see. We hurried along in silence. The pain in my leg was so intense that it seemed as if I should drop, but fear gave me strength. We reached the house and entered unobserved. Her first words were, Honey, now you is safe. Dem devils ain't coming to search dis house, but when I get you into Mrs. Safe Place, I will bring some nice hot supper. I specs you need it after all this skeering. Betty's vocation led her to think eating the most important thing in life. She did not realize that my heart was too full for me to care much about supper. The mistress came to meet us and led me up stairs to a small room over her own sleeping apartment. You will be safe here, Linda, said she. I keep this room to store away things that are out of use. The girls are not accustomed to be sent to it, and they will not suspect anything unless they hear some noise. I always keep it locked, and Betty shall take care of the key. But you must be very careful for my sake as well as your own, and you must never tell my secret, for it would ruin me and my family. I will keep the girls busy in the morning, that Betty may have a chance to bring you breakfast. But it will not do for her to come to you again till night. I will come to see you sometimes. Keep up your courage. I hope this state of things will not last long. Betty came with the nice hot supper, and the mistress hastened downstairs to keep things straight till she returned. How my heart overflowed with gratitude! Words choked in my throat, but I could have kissed the feet of my benefactress. For that deed of Christian womanhood, may God forever bless her. I went to sleep that night with the feeling that I was, for the present, the most fortunate slave in town. Morning came and filled my little cell with light. I thanked the Heavenly Father for this safe retreat. 
Opposite my window was a pile of feather beds. On the top of these, I could lie perfectly concealed and command a view of the street through which Dr. Flint passed to his office. Anxious as I was, I felt a gleam of satisfaction when I saw him. Thus far, I had outwitted him, and I triumphed over it. Who can blame slaves for being cunning? They are constantly compelled to resort to it. It is the only weapon of the weak and oppressed against the strength of their tyrants. I was daily hoping to hear that my master had sold my children, for I knew who was on the watch to buy them. But Dr. Flint cared even more for revenge than he did for money. My brother William and the good aunt who had served his family for 20 years, my little Benny and Ellen, who was a little over two years old, were thrust into jail as a means of compelling my relatives to give some information about me. He swore my grandmother should never see one of them again till I was brought back. They kept these facts from me for several days. When I heard that my little ones were in a loathsome jail, my first impulse was to go to them. I was encountering dangers for the sake of freeing them, and must I be the cause of their death? The thought was agonizing. My benefactress tried to soothe me by telling me that my aunt would take good care of the children while they remained in jail, but it added to my pain to think that the good old aunt, who had always been so kind to her sister's orphan children, should be shut up in prison for no other crime than loving them. I suppose my friends feared a reckless movement on my part knowing, as they did, that my life was bound up in my children. I received a note from my brother William. It was scarcely legible and ran thus. Wherever you are, dear sister, I beg of you not to come here. We are all much better off than you are. If you come, you will ruin us all. They would force you to tell where you had been or they would kill you. Take the advice of your friends, if not for the sake of me and your children at least for the sake of those you would ruin. Poor William. He also must suffer for being my brother. I took his advice and kept quiet. My aunt was taken out of jail at the end of a month because Mrs. Flint could not spare her any longer. She was tired of being her own housekeeper. It was quite too fatiguing to order her dinner and eat it, too. My children remained in jail, where Brother William did all he could for their comfort. Betty went to see them sometimes and brought me tidings. She was not permitted to enter the jail, but William would hold them up to the grated window while she chatted with them. When she repeated their prattle and told me how they wanted to see their ma, my tears would flow. Old Betty would exclaim, "'Lors, child, what's you crying about? Dem young'uns will kill you dead. Don't be so chicken-hearted.' If you does, you will never get through this world. Good old soul, she had gone through the world childless. She had never had little ones to clasp their arms round her neck. She had never seen their soft eyes looking into hers. No sweet little voices had called her mother. She had never pressed her own infants to her heart with the feeling that even in fetters there was something to live for. How could she realize my feelings? Betty's husband loved children dearly and wondered why God had denied them to him. He expressed great sorrow when he came to Betty with the tidings that Ellen had been taken out of jail and carried to Dr. Flint's. She had the measles a short time before they carried her to jail, and the disease had left her eyes affected. The doctor had taken her home to attend to them. My children had always been afraid of the doctor and his wife. They had never been inside of their house. Poor little Ellen cried all day to be carried back to prison. The instincts of childhood are true. She knew she was loved in the jail. Her screams and sobs annoyed Mrs. Flint. Before night, she called one of the slaves and said, Here, Bill, carry this brat back to the jail. I can't stand her noise. If she'd be quiet, I should like to keep the little minx. She'd make a handy waiting maid for my daughter by and by, but if she stayed here with her white face... I suppose I should either kill her or spoil her. I hope the doctor will sell them as far as wind and water can carry them. As for their mother, her ladyship will find out yet what she gets by running away. She hasn't so much feeling for her children as a cow has for its calf. If she had, she would have come back long ago to get them out of jail and save all this expense and trouble. The good-for-nothing hussy! 
When she is caught, she shall stay in jail in irons for one six months and then be sold to a sugar plantation. I shall see her broke in yet. What do you stand there for, Bill? Why don't you go off with the brat? Mind now that you don't let any of the niggers speak to her in the street. When these remarks were reported to me, I smiled at Mrs. Flint saying that she should either kill my child or spoil her. I thought to myself there was very little danger of the latter. I have always considered it as one of God's special providences that Ellen screamed till she was carried back to jail. That same night, Dr. Flint was called to a patient and did not return till near morning. Passing my grandmother's, he saw a light in the house and thought to himself, perhaps this has something to do with Linda. He knocked and the door was opened. What calls you up so early? said he. I saw your light, and I thought I'd just stop and tell you that I've found out where Linda is. I know where to put my hands on her, and I shall have her before twelve o'clock. When he had turned away, my grandmother and my uncle looked anxiously at each other. They did not know whether or not it was merely one of the doctor's tricks to frighten them. In their uncertainty, they thought it was best to have a message conveyed to my friend Betty. Unwilling to alarm her mistress, Betty resolved to dispose of me herself. She came to me and told me to rise and dress quickly. We hurried downstairs and across the yard into the kitchen. She locked the door and lifted up a plank in the floor. A buffalo skin and a bit of carpet were spread for me to lie on, and a quilt thrown over me. Stay dar, said she, till I sees if they know about you. They say they will put their hands on you for twelve o'clock. If they did know where you are, they won't know now. They'll be disappointed this time. That's all I got to say. If they comes rummaging among my things, they'll get one breasted sarassin from this here nigger. In my shallow bed, I had but just room enough to bring my hands to my face to keep the dust out of my eyes. For Betty walked over me twenty times in an hour, passing from the dresser to the fireplace. When she was alone, I could hear her pronouncing anathemas over Dr. Flint and all his tribe, every now and then saying, with a chuckling laugh, this nigger's too cute for him this time. When the housemaids were about, she had sly ways of drawing them out, that I might hear what they would say. She would repeat stories she had heard about my being in this or that or the other place, to which they would answer that I was not fool enough to be staying around there, that I was in Philadelphia or New York before this time. When all were abed and asleep, Betty raised the plank and said, Come out, child, come out. They don't know nothing about you. Twas only white folks, lies to scare the niggers. Some days after this adventure, I had a much worse fright. As I sat very still in my retreat above stairs, cheerful visions floated through my mind. I thought Dr. Flint would soon get discouraged and would be willing to sell my children. When he lost all hopes of making them the means of my discovery, I knew who was ready to buy them. Suddenly I heard a voice that chilled my blood. The sound was too familiar to me, and it had been too dreadful for me not to recognize at once my old master. He was in the house, and I at once concluded he had come to seize me. I looked round in terror. There was no way of escape. The voice receded. I suppose the constable was with him, and they were searching the house. In my alarm, I did not forget the trouble I was bringing on my generous benefactress. It seemed as if I were born to bring sorrow on all who befriended me. And that was the bitterest drop in the bitter cup of my life. After a while, I heard approaching footsteps. The key was turned to my door. I braced myself against the wall to keep from falling. I ventured to look up, and there stood my kind benefactress alone. I was too much overcome to speak and sunk down upon the floor. I thought you would hear your master's voice, she said, and knowing you would be terrified, I came to tell you there was nothing to fear. You may even indulge in a laugh at the old gentleman's expense. He is so sure you are in New York that he came to borrow $500 to go in pursuit of you. My sister had some money to loan on interest. He has obtained it and proposes to start for New York tonight. So for the present, you see you are safe. The doctor will merely lighten his pocket hunting after the bird he is left behind. Chapter 19. The Children Sold 
The doctor came back from New York, of course, without ac accomplishing his purpose. He had expended considerable money and was rather disheartened. My brother and the children had now been in jail two months, and that also was some expense. My friends thought it was a favorable time to work on his discouraged feelings. Mr. Sands sent a speculator to offer him $900 for my brother William and $800 for the two children. These were high prices as slaves were then selling, but the offer was rejected. If it had been merely a question of money, the doctor would have sold any boy of Benny's age for $200, but he could not bear to give up the power of revenge. But he was hard-pressed for money, and he revolved the matter in his mind. He knew that if he could keep Ellen till she was 15, he could sell her for a high price. But I presume he reflected that she might die or might be stolen away. At all events, he came to the conclusion that he had better accept the slave trader's offer. Meeting him in the street, he inquired when he would leave town. "'Today, at ten o'clock,' he replied. "'Ah, do you go so soon?' said the doctor. "'I have been reflecting upon your proposition, "'and I have concluded to let you have the three Negroes "'if you will say nineteen hundred dollars.' "'After some parley, the trader agreed to his terms. "'He wanted the bill of sale drawn up and signed immediately, "'as he had a great deal to attend to "'during the short time he remained in town. "'The doctor went to the jail and told William "'he would take him back into his service "'if he would promise to behave himself.' and he replied that he would rather be sold. "'And you shall be sold, you ungrateful rascal!' exclaimed the doctor. In less than an hour, the money was paid. The papers were signed, sealed, and delivered, and my brother and children were in the hands of the traitor. It was a hurried transaction, and after it was over, the doctor's characteristic caution returned. He went back to the speculator and said, Sir, I have come to lay you under obligations of a thousand dollars not to sell any of those Negroes in this state. You come too late, replied the trader. Our bargain is closed. He had, in fact, already sold them to Mr. Sands, but he did not mention it. The doctor required him to put irons on that rascal Bill and to pass through the back streets when he took his gang out of town. The trader was privately instructed to concede to his wishes. My good old aunt went to the jail to bid the children goodbye, supposing them to be the speculator's property, that she should never see them again. As she held Benny in her lap, he said, Aunt Nancy, I want to show you something. He led her to the door and showed her a long row of marks, saying, Uncle Will taught me to count. I have made a mark for every day I have been here, and it is sixty days. It is a long time, and the speculator is going to take me and Ellen away. He's a bad man. It's wrong for him to take grandmother's children. I want to go to my mother. My grandmother was told that the children would be restored to her, but she was requested to act as if they were really to be sent away. Accordingly, she made up a bundle of clothes and went to the jail. When she arrived, she found William handcuffed among the gang and the children in the trader's cart. The scene seemed too much like reality. She was afraid there might have been some deception or mistake. She fainted and was carried home. When the wagon stopped at the hotel, several gentlemen came out and proposed to purchase William. But the trader refused their offers without stating that he was already sold. And now came the trying hour for that drove of human beings, driven away like cattle to be sold they knew not where. Husbands were torn from wives, parents from children, never to look upon each other again this side the grave. There was ringing of hands and cries of despair. Dr. Flint had the supreme satisfaction of seeing the wagon leave town, and Mrs. Flint had the gratification of supposing that my children were going as far as wind and water would carry them. According to agreement, my uncle followed the wagon some miles until they came to an old farmhouse. There the trader took the irons from William, and as he did so, he said, You are a damned clever fellow. I should like to own you myself. Them gentlemen that wanted to buy you said you was a bright, honest chap, and I must get you a good home. 
I guess your old master will swear tomorrow and call himself an old fool for selling the children. I reckon he'll never get their mammy back again. I, I expect she made tracks for the North. Goodbye, old boy. Remember, I've done you a good turn. You must thank me by coaxing all the pretty gals to go with me next fall. That's going to be my last trip. This trading in niggers is a bad business for a fellow that's got any heart. Move on, you fellows. And the gang went on. God alone knows where. Much as I despise and detest the class of slave traders whom I regard as the vilest wretches on earth, I must do this man the justice to say that he seemed to have some feeling. He took a fancy to William in the jail and wanted to buy him. When he heard the story of my children, he was willing to aid them in getting out of Dr. Flint's power, even without charging the customary fee. My uncle procured a wagon and carried William and the children back to town. Great was the joy in my grandmother's house. The curtains were closed and the candles lighted. The happy grandmother cuddled the little ones to her bosom. They hugged her and kissed her and clapped their hands and shouted. She knelt down and poured forth one of her heartfelt prayers of thanksgiving to God. The father was present for a while, and though such a parental relation as existed between him and my children takes slight hold on the hearts or consciences of slaveholders, it must be that he experienced some moments of pure joy in witnessing the happiness he had imparted. I had no share in the rejoicings of that evening. The events of the day had not come to my knowledge, and now I will tell you something that happened to me, though you will perhaps think it illustrates the superstition of slaves. I sat in my usual place on the floor near the window, where I could hear much that was said in the street without being seen. The family had retired for the night, and all was still. I sat there thinking of my children, when I heard a low strain of music. A band of serenaders were under the window, playing Home Sweet Home. I listened till the sounds did not seem like music, but like the moaning of children. It seemed as if my heart would burst. I rose from my sitting posture and knelt. A streak of moonlight was on the floor before me, and in the midst of it appeared the forms of my two children. They vanished, but I had seen them distinctly. Some will call it a dream, others a vision. I know not how to account for it, but it made a strong impression on my mind, and I felt certain that something had happened to my little ones. I had not seen Betty since morning. Now I heard her softly turning the key. As soon as she entered, I clung to her and begged her to let me know whether my children were dead or whether they were sold, for I had seen their spirits in my room, and I was sure something had happened to them. "'Lord, child,' said she, putting her arms around me, "'you's got the high hysterics. I'll sleep with you tonight, "'cause you'll make a noise and ruin, missus. "'Something has stirred you up mightily. "'When you is done crying, I'll talk with you. "'De children is well and mighty happy. "'I see them myself. Does that satisfy you? "'Dar, child, be still. Somebody will hear you.' "'I tried to obey her. "'She lay down and was soon sound asleep, but... No sleep would come to my eyelids. At dawn, Betty was up and off to the kitchen. The hours passed on, and the vision of the night kept constantly recurring to my thoughts. After a while, I heard the voices of two women in the entry. In one of them I recognized the housemaid. The other said to her, "'Did you know Linda Brent's children was sold to the specul speculator yesterday?' They say old Massa Flint was mighty glad to see him drove out of town, but they say they've come back again. I spect it's all their daddy's doings. They say he's bought William, too. Lord, how it will take hold of old Massa Flint. I'm going round Aunt Marthy's to see about it. I bit my lips till the blood came to keep from crying out. Were my children with their grandmother, or had the speculator carried them off? The suspense was dreadful. Would Betty never come and tell me the truth about it? At last she came, and I eagerly repeated what I had overheard. Her face was one broad, bright smile. Lor, you foolish ting, said she. 
I's gwine to tell you about it. De gals is eating their breakfast. Missus told me to let her tell you, but poor creeter tain't right to keep you waiting. And I's gwine to tell you. Brudder, children, all is bought by de daddy. I's laugh more than enough, thinking about old Massa Flint. Lord, how he vil swar. He's got catch this time anyhow, but I must be getting out of this, or them gals will come and catch me. Betty went off laughing, and I said to myself, Can it be true that my children are free? I have not suffered for them in vain. Thank God. Great surprise was expressed when it was known that my children had returned to their grandmothers. The news spread through the town, and many a kind word was bestowed on the little ones. Dr. Flint went to my grandmother's to ascertain who was the owner of my children, and she informed him. "'I expected as much,' said he. "'I'm glad to hear it. I have had news from Linda lately, and I shall soon have her. You need never expect to see her free. She shall be my slave as long as I live, and when I am dead, she shall be the slave of my children. If I ever find out that you or Philip had anything to do with her running off, I'll kill him. And if I meet William in the street and he presumes to look at me, I'll flog him within an inch of his life. Keep those brats out of my sight. As he turned to leave, my grandmother said something to remind him of his own doings. He looked back upon her as if he would have been glad to strike her to the ground. I had my season of joy and thanksgiving. It was the first time since my childhood that I experienced any real happiness. I heard of the old doctor's threats, but they no longer had the same power to trouble me. The darkest cloud that hung over my life had rolled away. Whatever slavery might do to me, it could not shackle my children. If I fell a sacrifice, my little ones were saved. It was well for me that my simple heart believed all that had been promised for their welfare. It is always better to trust than to doubt. Chapter 20 New Perils The doctor, more exasperated than ever, again tried to revenge himself on my relatives. He arrested Uncle Philip on the charge of having aided my flight. He was carried before a court and swore truly that he knew nothing of my intention to escape and that he had not seen me since I left my master's plantation. The doctor then demanded that he should give bail for $500 that he would have nothing to do with me. Several gentlemen offered to be security for him. But Mr. Sand told him he had better go back to jail, and he would see that he came out without giving bail. The news of his arrest was carried to my grandmother, who conveyed it to Betty. In the kindness of her heart, she again stowed me away under the floor, and as she walked back and forth in the performance of her culinary duties, she talked apparently to herself, but with the intention that I should hear what was going on. I hoped that my uncle's imprisonment would last but few days. Still, I was anxious. I thought it likely Dr. Flint would do his utmost to taunt and insult him, and I was afraid my uncle might lose control of himself and retort in some way that would be construed into a punishable offense. And I was well aware that in court his word would not be taken against any white man's. The search for me was renewed. Something had excited suspicions that I was in the vicinity. They searched the house I was in. I heard their steps and their voices. At night, when all were asleep, Betty came to release me from my place of confinement. The fright I had undergone, the constrained posture, and the dampness of the ground made me ill for several days. My uncle was soon after taken out of prison, but the movements of all my relatives and of all our friends were very closely watched. We all saw that I could not remain where I was much longer. I had already stayed longer than was intended, and I knew my presence must be a source of perpetual anxiety to my kind benefactress. During this time, my friends had laid many plans for my escape, but the extreme vigilance of my persecutors made it impossible to carry them into effect. One morning, I was much startled by hearing somebody trying to get into my room. Several keys were tried, but none fitted. 
I instantly conjectured it was one of the housemaids, and I concluded she must either have heard some noise in the room or have noticed the entrance of Betty. When my friend came at her usual time, I told her what had happened. I knows who it was, said she. Pend upon it. "'Twas dat Jenny. Dat nigger allers got der debil in her.' I suggested that she might have seen or heard something that excited her curiosity. "'Tut, tut, child!' exclaimed Betty. "'She ain't seen nothing nor hear nothing. She only specks something. That's all. She wants to find out who ab cut and make my gown. But she won't never know. Dat's sartin. I'll get Mrs. to fix her.' I reflected a moment and said, Betty, I must leave here tonight. Do as you think best, poor child, she replied. I's mighty afraid that dat air nigger will pop on you sometime. She reported the incident to her mistress and received orders to keep Jenny busy in the kitchen till she could see my uncle Philip. He told her he would send a friend for me that very evening. She told him, she hoped I was going to the north, for it was very dangerous for me to remain anywhere in this vicinity. Alas, it was not an easy thing for one in my situation to go to the north. In order to leave the coast quite clear for me, she went into the country to spend the day with her brother and took Jenny with her. She was afraid to come and bid me goodbye, but she left a kind message with Betty. I heard her carriage roll from the door, and I never again saw her who had so generously befriended the poor, trembling fugitive. Though she was a slaveholder, to this day my heart blesses her. I had not the slightest idea where I was going. Betty brought me a suit of sailor's clothes, jacket, trousers, and tarpaulin hat. She gave me a small bundle, saying I might need it where I was going. In cheery tones, she exclaimed, I'm so glad you was gwine to free parts. Don't forget old Betty. Perhaps I'll come long by and by. I tried to tell her how grateful I felt for all her kindness, but she interrupted me. I don't want no tanks, honey. I was glad I could help you. And I hope to good Lord will open the path for you. I was gwine with you to the lower gate. Put your hands in your pockets and walk rickety like to sailors. I performed to her satisfaction. At the gate I found Peter, a young colored man, waiting for me. I had known him for years. He had been an apprentice to my father and had always borne a good character. I was not afraid to trust him. Betty bade me a hurried goodbye, and we walked off. Take courage, Linda, said my friend Peter. I've got a dagger, and no man shall take you from me unless he passes over my dead body. It was a long time since I had taken a walk out of doors, and the fresh air revived me. It was also pleasant to hear a human voice speaking to me above a whisper. I passed several people whom I knew, but they did not recognize me in my disguise. I prayed internally that, for Peter's sake as well as my own, nothing might occur to bring out his dagger. We walked on till we came to the wharf. My Aunt Nancy's husband was a seafaring man and it had been deemed necessary to let him into our secret. He took me into his boat, rowed out to a vessel not far from distant and hoisted me on board. We three were the only occupants of the vessel. I now ventured to ask what they proposed to do with me. They said I was to remain on board till near dawn and then they would hide me in Snaky Swamp till my Uncle Philip had prepared a place of concealment for me. If the vessel had been bound north, it would have been of no avail to me, for it would have certainly have been searched. About four o'clock we were again seated in the boat and rowed three miles to the swamp. My fear of snakes had been increased by the venomous bite I had received, and I dreaded to enter this hiding place. But I was in no situation to choose, and I gratefully accepted the best that my poor persecuted friends could do for me. Peter landed first, and with a large knife, cut a path through the bamboos and briars of all descriptions. He came back, took me in his arms, and carried me to a seat made among the bamboos. Before we reached it, we were covered with hundreds of mosquitoes. In an hour's time, they had so poisoned my flesh that I was a pitiful sight to behold. 
As the light increased, I saw snake after snake crawling around us. I had been accustomed to the sight of snakes all my life, but these were larger than any I had ever seen. To this day, I shudder when I remember that morning. As evening approached, the number of snakes increased so much that we were continually obliged to thrash them with sticks to keep them from crawling over us. The bamboos were so high and so thick that it was impossible to see beyond a very short distance. Just before it became dark, we procured a seat near to the entrance of the swamp, being fearful of losing our way back to the boat. It was not long before we heard the paddle of oars and the low whistle which had been agreed upon as a signal. We made haste to enter the boat, and we were rowed back to the vessel. I passed a wretched night, for the heat of the swamp, the mosquitoes, and the constant terror of snakes had brought on a burning fever. I had just dropped asleep when they came and told me it was time to go back to that horrid swamp. I could scarcely summon courage to rise, but even those large venomous snakes were less dreadful to my imagination than the white men in that community called civilized. This time Peter took a quantity of tobacco to burn, to keep off the mosquitoes. It produced the desired effect on them, but gave me nausea and severe headache. At dark we returned to the vessel. I had been so sick during the day that Peter declared I should go home that night if the devil himself was on patrol. They told me a place of concealment had been provided for me at my grandmother's. I could not imagine how it was possible to hide me in her house, every nook and corner of which was known to the Flint family. They told me to wait and see. We were rowed ashore and went boldly through the streets to my grandmother's. I wore my sailor's clothes and had blackened my face with charcoal. I passed several people whom I knew. The father of my children came so near that I brushed against his arm, but he had no idea who it was. You must make the most of this walk, said my friend Peter, for you may not have another very soon. I thought his voice sounded sad. It was kind of him to conceal from me what a dismal hole was to be my home for a long, long time. Chapter 21 The Loophole of Retreat A small shed had been added to my grandmother's house years ago. Some boards were laid across the joists at the top, and between these boards and the roof was a very small garret never occupied by anything but rats and mice. It was a pent roof, covered with nothing but shingles, according to the southern custom for such buildings. The garret was only nine feet long and seven feet wide. The highest part was three feet high and sloped down abruptly to the loose board floor. There was no admission for either light or air. My uncle Philip, who was a carpenter, had very skillfully made a concealed trapdoor, which communicated with the storeroom. He had been doing this while I was waiting in the swamp. The storeroom opened up onto a piazza. To this hole I was conveyed as soon as I entered the house. The air was stifling, the darkness total. A bed had been spread on the floor. I could sleep quite comfortably on one side, but the slope was so sudden that I could not turn on the other without hitting the room. The rats and mice ran over my bed, but I was weary, and I slept such sleep as the wretched may when a tempest has passed over them. Morning came. I knew it only by the noises I heard, for in my small den day and night were all the same. I suffered for air even more than for light, but I was not comfortless. I heard the voices of my children. There was joy and there was sadness in the sound. It made my tears flow. How I longed to speak to them. I was eager to look on their faces, but there was no hole, no crack through which I could peep. This continued darkness was oppressive. It seemed horrible to sit or lie in a cramped position day after day without one gleam of light. Yet I would have chosen this rather than my lot as a slave though white people considered it an easy one, and it was so compared with the fate of others. I was never cruelly overworked. I was never lacerated with the whip from head to foot. I was never so beaten and bruised that I could not turn from one side to the other. I never had my heel strings cut to prevent my running away. 
I was never chained to a log and forced to drag it about while I toiled in the fields from morning till night. I was never branded with hot iron or torn by bloodhounds. On the contrary, I had always been kindly treated and tenderly cared for until I came into the hands of Dr. Flint. I had never wished for freedom till then. But though my life in slavery was comparatively devoid of hardships, God pity the woman who was compelled to lead such a life. My food was passed up to me through the trapdoor my uncle had contrived. And my grandmother, my Uncle Philip, and Aunt Nancy would seize such opportunities as they could to mount up there and chat with me at the opening. But of course, this was not safe in the daytime. It must all be done in darkness. It was impossible for me to move in an erect position, but I crawled about my den for exercise. One day I hit my head against something and found it was a gimlet. My uncle had left it sticking there when he made the trap door. I was as rejoiced as Robinson Crusoe could have been at finding such a treasure. It put a lucky thought into my head. I said to myself, now I will have some light. Now I will see my children. I did not dare to begin my work during the daytime for fear of attracting attention. But I groped round and having found the side next to the street where I could frequently see my children, I stuck the gimlet in and waited for evening. I bored three rows of holes, one above the other. Then I bored out the interstices between. I thus succeeded in making one hole about an inch long and an inch broad. I sat by it till late into the night to enjoy the little whiff of air that floated in. In the morning, I watched for my children. The first person I saw in the street was Dr. Flint. I had a shuddering, superstitious feeling that it was a bad omen. Several familiar faces passed by. At last I heard the merry laugh of children, and presently two sweet little faces were looking up at me as though they knew I was there, and were conscious of the joy they imparted. How I longed to tell them I was there. My condition was now a little improved, but for weeks I was tormented by hundreds of little red insects, fine as needles point that pierced through my skin and produced an intolerable burning. The good grandmother gave me herb teas and cooling medicines, and finally I got rid of them. The heat of my den was intense, for nothing but thin shingles protected me from the scorching summer sun. But I had my consolations. Through my peeping hole, I could watch the children, and when they were near enough, I could hear their talk. Aunt Nancy brought me all the news she could hear at Dr. Flint's. From her, I learned that the doctor had written to New York to a colored woman who had been born and raised in our neighborhood and had breathed his contaminating atmosphere. He offered her a reward if she could find out anything about me. I know not what was the nature of her reply. But he soon after started for New York in haste, saying to his family that he had business of importance to transact. I peeped at him as he passed on his way to the steamboat. It was a satisfaction to have miles of land and water between us, even for a little while, and it was a still greater satisfaction to know that he believed me to be in the free states. My little den seemed less dreary than it had done. He returned, as he did from his former journey to New York, without obtaining any satisfactory information. When he passed our house next morning, Benny was standing at the gate. He had heard them say that he had gone to find me, and he called out, Dr. Flint, did you bring my mother home? I want to see her. The doctor stamped his foot at him in a rage and exclaimed, Get out of the way, you little damned rascal. If you don't, I'll cut off your head. Benny ran terrified into the house, saying, You can't put me in jail again, and I don't belong to you now. It was well that the wind carried the words away from the doctor's ear. I told my grandmother of it when we had our next conference at the trapdoor, and begged of her not to allow the children to be impertinent to the irascible old man. Autumn came, with a pleasant abatement of heat. My eyes had become accustomed to the dim light, and by holding my book or work in a certain position near the aperture I contrived to read and sew, that was a great relief to the tedious monotony of my life. 
But when winter came, the cold penetrated through the thin shingle roof, and I was dreadfully chilled. The winters there are not so long or so severe as in northern latitudes, but the houses are not built to shelter from cold, and my little den was peculiarly comfortless. The kind grandmother brought me bedclothes and warm drinks. Often I was obliged to lie in bed all day to keep comfortable. But with all my precautions... My shoulders and feet were frostbitten. Oh, those long, gloomy days, with no object for my eye to rest upon and no thoughts to occupy my mind, except the dreary past and the uncertain future. I was thankful when there came a day sufficiently mild for me to wrap myself up and sit at the loophole to watch the passers-by. Southerners had the habit of stopping and talking in the streets, and I heard many conversations not intended to meet my ears. I heard slave hunters planning how to catch some poor pu fugitive. Several times I heard allusions to Dr. Flint, myself, and the history of my children, who perhaps were playing near the gate. One would say, I wouldn't move my little finger to catch her as old Flint's property. Another would say, I'll catch any nigger for the reward. A man ought to have what belongs to him, if he is a damned brute. The opinion was often expressed that I was in the free states. Very rarely did anyone suggest that I might be in the vicinity. Had the least suspicion rested on my grandmother's house, it would have been burned to the ground. But it was the last place they thought of. Yet there was no place where slavery existed that could have afforded me so good a place of concealment. Dr. Flint and his family repeatedly tried to coax and bribe my children to tell something they had heard said about me. One day the doctor took them into a shop and offered them some bright little silver pieces and gay handkerchiefs if they would tell where their mother was. Ellen shrank away from him and would not speak. But Benny spoke up and said, Dr. Flint, I don't know where my mother is. I guess she's in New York, and when you go there again, I wish you'd ask her to come home, for I want to see her. But if you put her in jail or tell her you'll cut her head off, I'll tell her to go right back. Chapter 23 Christmas Festivities Christmas was approaching. Grandmother brought me materials, and I busied myself making some new garments and little playthings for my children. Were it not that hiring day is near at hand, and many families are fearfully looking forward to the probability of separation in a few days, Christmas might be a happy season for the poor slaves. Even slave mothers try to gladden the hearts of their little ones on that occasion. Benny and Ellen had their Christmas stockings filled. Their imprisoned mother could not have the privilege of witnessing their surprise and joy, but I had the pleasure of peeping at them as they went into the street with their new suits on. I heard Benny ask a little playmate whether Santa Claus brought him anything. Yes, replied the boy, but Santa Claus ain't a real man. It's the children's mothers that put things into the stockings. No, that can't be, replied Benny, for Santa Claus brought Ellen and me these new clothes, and my mother has been gone this long time. How I longed to tell them that his mother made those garments, and that many a tear fell on them while she worked. Every child rises early on Christmas morning to see the Chonkinaus. Without them, Christmas would be shorn of its greatest attraction. They consist of companies of slaves from the plantations, generally of the lower class. Two athletic men in calico wrappers have a net thrown over them, covered with all manner of bright-colored stripes. Cow's tails are fastened to their backs, and their heads are decorated with horns. A box covered with sheepskin is called the gumbo box. A dozen beat on this, while others strike triangles and jawbones to which bands of dancers keep time. For a month previous, they are composing songs which are sung on this occasion. These companies, of a hundred each, turn out early in the morning, and they are allowed to go round till twelve o'clock, begging for contributions. Not a door is left unvisited where there is the least chance of obtaining a penny or a glass of rum. They do not drink while they are out, but carry the rum home in jugs to have a carousal. These Christmas donations frequently amount to twenty or thirty dollars. It is seldom that any white man or child refuses to give them a trifle. If he does, they regale his ears with the following song. 
Poor massa, so they say. Down in de heel, so they say. Got no money, so they say. Not one shillin, so they say. God Almighty bless you, so they say. Christmas is a day of feasting, both with white and colored people. Slaves who are lucky enough to have a few shillings are sure to spend them for good eating, and many a turkey and pig is captured without saying, By your leave, sir. Those who cannot obtain these cook a possum or a raccoon from which savory dishes can be made. My grandmother raised poultry and pigs for sale, and it was her established custom to have both a turkey and a pig roasted for Christmas dinner. On this occasion, I was warned to keep extremely quiet, because two guests had been invited. One was the town constable, and the other was a free colored man who tried to pass himself off for white, and who was always ready to do any mean work for the sake of currying favor with white people. My grandmother had a motive for inviting them. She managed to take them all over the house. All the rooms on the lower floor were thrown open for them to pass in and out. And after dinner, they were invited upstairs to look at a fine mockingbird my uncle had just brought home. There, too, the rooms were all thrown open that they might look in. When I heard them talking on the piazza, my heart almost stood still. I knew this colored man had spent many nights hunting for me. Everybody knew... He had the blood of a slave father in his veins, but for the sake of passing himself off for white, he was ready to kiss the slaveholder's feet. How I despised him! As for the constable, he wore no false colors. The duties of his office were despicable, but he was superior to his companion, inasmuch as he did not pretend to be what he was not. Any white man who could raise money enough to buy a slave would have considered himself degraded by being a constable but the office enabled its possessor to exercise authority. If he found any slave out after nine o'clock, he could whip him as much as he liked, and that was a privilege to be coveted. When the guests were ready to depart, my grandmother gave each of them some of her nice pudding as a present for their wives. Through my people, I saw them go out of the gate, and I was glad when it closed after them. So passed the first Christmas in my den.